Okay, good evening. Uh, tonight I'll be answering questions from our website. Uh, I've gotten quite behind, and so in order to catch up, uh, I, I was not sure really how to deal with questions that are straightforward, easy to answer, that don't require a, a long talk of their own. And so I thought I'd put them all together here. I've separated them out and I'm going to go through them. These are, so tonight's going to be about questions that are easy to answer but pertinent. So important questions that point out something that's getting in the way of your practice of meditation. You need to find an answer to help overcome doubt, to cultivate right practice, to put you on the right track clear up misunderstandings, that sort of thing. So I'm going to go through them. There's, uh, there's quite a few. We'll see. Hopefully it won't take too long. But there won't be any main uh, long talk tonight, hopefully. It'll just be sort of miscellaneous teachings. We're looking at meditation, various aspects of meditation. All of these questions can be generalized. So we'll try to come up with some general comments that help not only the specific person but deal with the general topic. First question um, is one of these odd sort of questions. I've been getting questions by people who clearly know something about Buddhism and are asking very simple <coughs> I'm sorry. Not they're not odd questions, they're just they're actually quite good questions. But this question is labeling refuge. It's odd, odd in the sense that it sounds odd. But it's actually quite a good question from a Buddhist perspective. Very simple. It's a good sign, really, when someone asks very simple questions without using a lot of words, right to the point, and very much on point. The answer is a resounding yes. Um, labeling. Labeling, the labeling practice that we do, people call it labeling, is the practice of reminding yourself. It's a artificial, purposeful, conscious effort to evoke states of mindfulness. It might be better to say actually that mindfulness is the refuge, mindfulness being a state where you recognize and grasp something just as it is, without any judgment or partiality or reaction. And so the labeling, what you call labeling, which I would say is like, describe as repeating a mantra to yourself, or reminding yourself, finding a word that reminds you of the experience, is a practice that is meant to evoke a state of clarity of mind that is a refuge. So we talked recently about refuge. The, the Buddha is a refuge, the Dhamma is a refuge, the Sangha is a refuge. But the Buddha said also take yourself as a refuge. And if you understand what it means to take the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha as a refuge, it really means to take mindfulness as a refuge, which is how you have yourself as a refuge. And here's two questions that are actually quite related, interestingly, uh, one after another. Someone hears voices in their head speaking to them. Why? Please help. Mm -hmm. So the question is, why do I hear the voices in my head? Which is not a very good question. I mean, it's a reasonable question. It's a qu sort of question that I get quite often. And so let's make a general explanation here on these sorts of questions. Someone asks why something happened. More likely to ask it, the more uh, strange, uh, extraordinary the experience is. So they wouldn't say something like, why do I feel pain? Unless it's a fairly strange pain or extraordinary pain. But when you hear voices, well that's an extraordinary experience, so you want to ask why do you hear the voices. Asking why you hear something 
the reason why I can say that it's not a very good question or it's not the right question to be asking, it, re it re relies on uh, understanding that relies on an understanding of the fact that hearing voices in your head seemingly out of the blue is no different from feeling pain in your knees. The, the difference is that uh, from your perspective the cause of the pain is quite easy to see. Well, the cause is that I'm sitting cross-legged. But the cause of the pain or the cause of the voices in your head is not important. They are the same in the sense that they are experiences. You experience the voices in your head. We are actually not at all concerned with why something happens. We're concerned about understanding the nature of things. It's not about why something comes or how to make it go away. All of that is caught up in conceptualization, past, future. It's, it's very much a trigger for liking and disliking, for ego and all sorts of things. So asking why you hear voice in your head isn't actually important. The voices are in your head and the important thing is to teach yourself, to train yourself, to see that they are just sound. It's sound in the mind, it's an experience of hearing. And so you would say to yourself, hearing, hearing, trying to teach yourself that. When you react to the voices, you're afraid of them, or you like them, or you dislike them, or they make you sad, or whatever. You should note that as well. Sad, sad, liking, disliking, and so on. Afraid. And the second question is the same about colors. Can you explain about seeing, can you explain seeing colors while meditating? So this maybe is more related to asking about what is the significance of them. Not why do they come, but what do they mean? So if I see this color, does it mean that, and does that color mean this, and so on. And the same, the answer is the same. We're not concerned about what anything means. Meaning is an abstraction, it's an extrapolation. And certainly in, in other, um, in other circumstances or other, other uh, points of view, this is quite useful if you're working in a research field or in many many employ types of employment, you do have to be able to s figure out what things mean, what do statistics mean, what do figures mean, what does this mean, what does that mean. If you're doing any kind of analysis in in the world, then you need to know what things mean. But in meditation, mindfulness meditation, it's important to understand it's categorically different. We're not trying to understand what things mean. We just want to understand things as they are, and understand why we cling to them, and understand that they're not worth clinging to when you see them clearly just as they are. The only, the important thing is that you stop clinging to them. Here's a question about rebirth. So, this person has the understanding that consciousness is reborn. Please define consciousness. So consciousness is not reborn. First, it's not really your question, but it's important to point out consciousness is, an, is a moment of awareness and it's not reborn. There's nothing reborn. Consciousness is the experience of awareness. When you're aware of seeing, when there's an experience of seeing, part of that experience is an awareness of it. Awareness is a part of any experience. You wouldn't call it experience if there wasn't a consciousness of it. And that consciousness is a part of that experience. So there's nothing about being reborn when there's an experience of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, thinking. Part of that experience, that momentary experience, is awareness, is what we call consciousness. Here's a good question, and it, it, I, I've answered this sort of question a lot, but it's worth going over again. When one feels an emotion such as fear, there are multiple components to it, such as thoughts, urges, and the emotion itself. How should one note that? Do we need to note it all? Yes, absolutely. This is, I think, crucial in really making the break from conceptual reality, breaking through to ultimate reality. Break up fear. I am afraid. No, what's going on there? There's fear, there's thinking, there's this experience like seeing and hearing when you hear voices or whatever. Uh, there's liking and disliking. There's physical manifestations like the tension or the body shaking in fear and so on. All emotions are like this. There's more to it than just I have a phobia or I am depressed or I have anxiety. 
There's many aspects to it, and absolutely noting all of them will help you see what's really going on. Will help you destroy the the boogeyman of of fear and so on. It's no longer a problem. It's just moments of experience, which is more than just fear, and it's essential also for for being present. Because if you say, "Okay, I'm going to be mindful of fear," and you ignore everything else, and you don't realize that there's much more to it, you you you're never really being mindful. You're just saying free, afraid, afraid, but your mind is doing all sorts of other things that you're not even paying attention to. That happens. People get obsessed with one thing and. I would say, why isn't it going away? Why isn't it getting better? And they're not being mindful of everything else. So very important. How do you forgive yourself for hurting people in the past? You don't actually, technically I would say, you don't forgive yourself. You just let go of the whatever it is that you call not forgiving yourself. Right? So when you've done things to people in the past, you feel bad about it. You feel sad or angry, hating yourself. Uh, you feel ashamed or so on, you feel guilty, worried and so on. All of that is what you have to let go of. So actually don't worry about forgiving yourself. Just learn, look at, see, look at your emotions and learn to see clearly what it is that you do to yourself when you get angry, when you feel frustrated, when you feel sad, when you feel worried, afraid and so on, when these thoughts come up. So again, it's not about um, yourself that you're forgiving, that would be completely conceptual. What is reality is, oh, here's some experiences of thinking, like remembering the past, which is a thought, and then there's reaction to that, violent, negative reaction to that, and start to see all those things clearly, and you'll see how useless it is and how much suffering is caused. You'll just abandon it because you see it's not worth it. When meditating, is it safe to replace seeing with there is seeing, and so on? Because there appears to be an implicit I'm seeing. So the idea is that that would be a problem, removes the ambiguity and vulnerability. So to be clear, I'm seeing is not a problem. It's not a problem to say I am seeing. The Buddha used those words, kachami, uh, nisinomi, I am walking, I am sitting. Like the, the Pali lends itself exactly to a first person perspective without the, without the subject, because they, they would just say walking, and that would mean, it would, it would be a way of saying walking, that would mean I am walking. There's one word for walking that means I am walking, there's another word for walking that means you are walking, and so on. But the I am is not really a problem. Why we don't say I am walking, and so on, is we don't want to put emphasis on it. The emphasis is on the seeing or the walking or so on. But there's still an implication that I am doing it. And that's fine, as long as you don't put the emphasis on, on like, hey, this is a self that is walking, right? Which you're not doing. Collo it's co colloquial, which means it's the ordinary manner of speaking. When you say, I am walking, it doesn't mean I believe in a self that is walking. It's just a way of telling me, no, it's not that person over there that I'm referring to. It's this person here, right? And it's not even a matter of it being a person, it's just locating it. I'm walking, I'm walking. And it's, it's just the way that we speak, so there's absolutely no problem as long as you don't emphasize this is I, this is the me, this the ego, the soul that is walking. Just simply saying I am walking is not a problem, so don't worry about that. But could you say there is seeing, I think it's too conceptual. You're, you're making too much of a deal that way. When you say there is seeing, trying to make it artificially objective and remove the self, that's not what, how you get to non-self. You get to non-self by not making a deal out of things, by not creating entities, creating, uh, even creating not-self, right? If you say, uh, I, don't, I don't believe in self, then there's a self involved there. I want to stop. There's a control involved. Here's a person who suffers from constant pains and has also suffered from anxiety and depression, went on retreats and anxieties are gone, but still the pain is there. Could the pain, could I resolve the pain if I become a monk and practice for years? We're not trying to resolve pain. Pain is an experience. It's not bad. It's not a problem. What you should now be doing is looking at your reactions to the pain. You say you've given up anxiety and depression, but if you want the pain to go away, that means you don't like it. So it's not the pain that's a problem, it's the disliking. 
And what you should be doing is focusing on both the pain but also the disliking and learning to see the pain objectively so that you let go of this need to get rid of it, which is a disliking, which is actually the root of the problem. Which goes with every kind of problem. It's not the problem itself, it's our reactions to it and how we, how we turn it into a problem. Here's one. Here's a long question. It's basically this question about doesn't doesn't noting distract you from the experience? Yes and no. In the beginning, it's quite possible that you just see words in your head or you hear words in the ear when you when you pretend repeating it to yourself, like repeating it to yourself in your head. You focus very much on the words. That can be very common in the beginning, um, but that's not proper practice. Correct practice. Allows is a means of reminding yourself that's what it is. It's just telling yourself, yes. Instead of saying, this is bad, this is me, this is mine, this is good, this is a problem, this is right, or so on. You're saying, this is this. Because we do that anyway in our minds. When you feel pain, you say, this is a problem. There's a, there's a thought process that, that reacts to it, saying something about it. What we say about it just changes. We change what we say about it. Instead of saying this is a problem or this is bad, we say this is this. Uh, and, and the yes part is that what that does is keeps you from going in deeply to it and, and looking at the particulars and the details. Seeing is just seeing. When you see a dog, we're not interested in seeing the dog. We're interested in reminding ourselves that is an experience of seeing. Experience it and let it go. Don't go into the details. So it does to some extent keep you away from the experience. It's not meant to make you go deeper and see some some special truth where suddenly, oh, there's impermanence, oh, there's non-self. Impermanence is when you say seeing it disappears. Oh, it disappeared, it's impermanent, that's all. Here's a, here's a question that I just have to say yes to, I think. I feel that I feel that it is noting that helps me acknowledge and perceive things as they are without any judgment while I am meditating. I'd like to know if this is indeed the right way to meditate. Yes. Very good question. I mean, this, this is to me a sign this person knows what's what. How can one cultivate mudita? So I've been deleting questions about metta and karuna and mudita and I probably stopped that but I'll just answer them in this way. Um, but mudita, mudita, it's an interesting question because it is a good question. It's one we don't hear about a lot. So you hear metta, may you be happy. Karuna, may you be free from suffering. What do you say to yourself or to someone else when you want to express mudita? I think, it, I mean, it's a very obvious answer, but it's, it, it's not obvious because we don't teach it. We don't say, hey, that is practicing mudita bhavana, right? We don't talk about mudita bhavana. We have metta bhavana, karuna bhavana. But mudita bhavana is very uncommon. And yet, it's very obvious because in Buddhist circles, if you have some experience with Buddhist culture, we're always using mudita, we're always expressing mudita. In fact, they use that word when a, when a, when a monk uh, has a birthday or when a monk gets a promotion, they have Thailand, they have ranks and monks get rank promotions. They'll, they'll express mudita. Mudita means joy. It means wishing, uh, expressing appreciation for someone else. We call something, we say anumodana. Anumodana is really mudita. Anu means towards or, or, or following. It can also mean small, I think. But here I think it just means towards something. So anumod comes from mud. Modana is the noun, mood is from is the verb, so the root is mood, come, becomes mod, anumodana, and this is a word you'll hear all the time. People will actually say to others, anumodana, it means I appreciate what happened, I appreciate what you did. Another word that we use is sadhu, sadhu, when we hear about when someone says, I went to do meditation, you say, oh sadhu, and you appreciate the goodness. So we use mudita all the time. It, in a formal setting, if you want to take it as meditation, you think of someone for whom good things have happened to, and you say, good things have come to this person, that is good, that is right. 
and and you repeat to yourself, it is good, it is right, sadhu, and the other one is suttu, I think. But the Visuddhi Magga has, has specific phrases you can say in Pali, like in, for metta it's like sabbe sata sukita hontu, and, and uh, for mudita it's something like uh, good has come to this person, something good has come to this person, sadhu, that is sadhu, that is suttu, that is good, that is right. So there's, if you want to do it as a meditation, that is something you should look into in the Visuddhi Magga. If you want to just understand how you do it in regular life, which is, I think, a great thing, just remember to say sadhu, or you can say it in English, of course, but in Buddhist circles we'll say sadhu or we'll say anumodana to express our appreciation. Can a lay person achieve nirvana or the complete cessation of suffering? Yes. Yeah, I just, um, just coincidentally, just saw someone write something on Reddit saying that that's not possible, and I responded and I say, I said a layperson can become an arahant, because I mean, I mean, who am I to say that a layperson can become an arahant? Maybe I'm wrong, May, and 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 what proof do I have? But the general consensus in Theravada Buddhism is that a lay person can become an arahant. Now I don't know actually if that's true, maybe there are some teachers who teach that it's not true, but the orthodox understanding, and if you ask any, I would say any orthodox scholar, I would be quite surprised if any of them say, no, it's not possible. There's stories of lay people becoming arahants, the Melinda Panha says it's possible, uh, there's commentary, yeah, there, there's just stories. The, the orthodox understanding is that if a lay person becomes an arahant, they'll die within seven days, or Melinda, you know, Nagasena says one day, I think, but so there's a discrepancy there. But they'll die probably because, well, first of all, because they won't bother getting food for themselves, but secondly, also because it's a very strong thing, and there's some sense that actually being a lay person as an arahant it just doesn't support it, and you just pass away. Either that, or you become ordained. And there's story. There's there's verses. There's places where the Buddha actually said, um, you know, "This person is either going to become a monk, or else they're going to pass away." Kema was an example. Kema, who was a queen, she became an arahant, and the Buddha said, mm, "She either has to become a bhikkhuni, or she's going to pass away." And the king said, "Well, don't no more passing. No more talk about passing away. Let her become a bhikkhuni." Um, but okay, but let's put that debate aside because it's a kind of a um, meaningless debate. It's a fruitless debate. If you're at the point where you're an anagami, which certainly a lay person can become an anagami, and you're not sure if you can become an arahant, well then we'll talk, and then we can debate it and say, oh, you're right, it's just not possible, or oh, look, there that person became an arahant. But until you become an anagami, really don't worry about it, because absolutely the number of lay people who become sotapanna is just beyond. Uh, counting, Sakadagami, so many, Anagami, there are many examples. So worry about becoming an Arahant and freeing yourself completely from suffering when you get to that stage. You should have no worries about practicing as a lay person because there's absolutely evidence and verification that lay people can see Nibbana. Is it advisable to have two teachers? So this, is, this person is concerned about uh, learning from our online group and maybe taking an online course, but then they also have a teacher in lay life, in in in, in, order, in what you, real life, non-internet life, so that they can meet in the physical. Uh, they can go to see this person, and they're wondering, is it okay? And my first thought is, of course, it's okay. You can have as many teachers as you want. There's some caution to be had there. If you're practicing two types of meditation, which you actually explicitly say you're not, then that's a problem, but you're avoiding that. Any person who teaches you Orthodox Buddhism, Theravada Buddhism, absolutely learn from them. Learn the suttas, learn the, the, the explanations. If their explanations are Orthodox, absolutely, go ahead. 
because you're taking the Buddha as your teacher. Ultimately, we only have one teacher, and that's the Buddha. The rest of us are teachers in a conventional sense, in a mundane, ordinary sense, but we're only teachers insofar as we can help you to understand the Dhamma that was taught by the Buddha. And if a person is giving you, reciting to you, or explaining to you in a very ordinary way, a very straightforward manner, the Buddha's teaching, then it doesn't matter what meditation you're practicing, or, or it doesn't matter that you have another meditation teacher, right? because they're going to help you with the Buddha's teaching. The only thing I guess I would say is don't study too much. You don't need too much teaching. Right? Teaching is not a... In fact, teaching is not really a thing. You don't teach someone enlightenment, right? The Buddha said, Akata Roda Thagata. We are, the Buddhas are just ones who show the way. Even a Buddha doesn't teach people in, in the sense of, of uh, teaching them enlightenment, right? Enlightenment isn't a thing you teach. You just show them the way. You have to practice for yourself. But don't worry about, um, you know, I certainly don't think you have to be concerned with only having one teacher. In meditation, you should only have one practice at a time. And, and best is only have one person guiding you in meditation at a time because that's where it starts to get potentially dangerous and complicated and mixed up. But as far as people teaching you Buddhism, you know, ordinary people who are not even Buddhists can teach you things. They'll teach you many things. Even, even evil people teach you many things. I sometimes lose count of how many steps I move when I'm doing walking meditation. So you don't have to count how many steps you're taking. Really, you should have a line. You're much better off saying, okay, till that line is where I'm going. Don't count your steps ever. Sounds like this person has made a misunderstanding. If you say it's going to be 10 steps, then that's fine, but fight, figure out where that 10 steps is and stop there. It's in fact not really important. You say, okay, now I'm going to turn, turn around. I usually do it in my room, one wall to the other, or one end of the carpet to the other, that sort of thing. You don't need that much room. You can even do it with like even six feet, eight feet, it's fine. So here's a person who has, has suffered from anxiety and depression. It sounds like that's letting go, that's working itself out, maybe not completely, but good work for you working on it. But they're asking about pleasures, sensual pleasures. So there are some pleasures that they don't seem that bad. And they think, maybe if I'm mindful about these things, well, I enjoy these pleasures. If I'm mindful, is that going to mitigate sort of their, their harmful effects? And what about partially wholesome? Like, like he mentions a Beatles song, Let It Be, which sounds kind of wholesome, you know? Beatles reminding me to let it be. So if I listen to the Beatles and I try to be mindful, is that bad or is that as bad and so on? I mean, it's a good question, really. There's definitely some things that are bad, worse than others. Like um, this, uh, this show that everyone's watching, Game of Thrones. I keep talking about it. I don't really know. My, I asked my mom about it, and she, she gave me some philosophical reason for watching it. But it sounds like it's just a bunch of evil people. Everybody's evil. And she said, no, there's some good people. And I said, but they just all die. And she said, yeah, they all... So I don't know. Anyway, I, a show, a, a, um, a, a song, let's say a song, because I used to listen to music. Um, I used to listen to heavy metal, and my brother listened to rap music. And rap music, you think, what well, we did in the 80s or the 90s, we thought of rap music, you get the sense that rap music is... Is, is upbeat, you know, and heavy metal you think of as just evil, right, Satan. But we were, I remember talking with my mother about it, and it, we realized that rap music is just awful for the most part. It talks about all sorts of, you know, well, I mean, drugs and, and, and it can be, it can be very, ang very, some of the, sometimes rap music, I mean, Fresh Prince, we used to listen to French Prince, rap music, and it was kind of fun. It was fun to listen to, but there's evil. So, you know, there's, there's stuff that is just about, uh, just kind of 
I don't know. I think you can't avoid saying it's unwholesome. And heavy metal music, on the other hand, is often about very philosophical and poetic things. Not always, but often about lamenting things or, or uh, even very pure in some way. Anyway, this is many years ago. There are different kinds of entertainment, certainly, and some of it is worse than others. And, and that is worth pointing out. It is worth noting. Um, but the bigger question, well, there's a couple of things we can say. Another thing we can say is there's a difference between those unwholesome things and entertainment. So if, if you're listening to music about killing or stealing or lying or cheating or drugs and alcohol or so on, there's a problem there because it's relating you to back to killing and stealing and lying and cheating and it's potentially reinforcing them. Not necessarily. It's not like you listen to a movie about, uh, listen to a song about drugs and you're going to go take drugs. But it reinforces something there and it, it creates this resonance in your mind where you're thinking about that. So you might be better off served, as you say, by listening to the Beatles, Let It Be or so on. Even though they were probably on drugs when they wrote a lot of those songs. Um, so, what you have to understand about entertainment itself, the entertainment part is not going to pull you away from the, the, the path. It's just going to make it harder because the entertainment aspect of it, regardless of the content, which can be varied, the entertainment aspect is a pleasure. It's a addiction to pleasure and the re the reinforcement of that addiction cycle and the um, building up of cycles in the mind that require stimulus. So that is getting in the way of your seeing clearly because it's a reaction, it's a liking, it's an enjoying. And then there's the disliking when you don't get it and you're back and forth between liking and disliking. That's problematic. That gets in the way of your practice. But it doesn't take you backwards. It doesn't go in the opposite direction of enlightenment. It just prevents you from seeing clearly. If you can try to be mindful when you're engaging in entertainment, even when you're having sex, potentially, I assume, um, when you're masturbating, when you're uh, watching a movie, when you're listening to music, when you're uh, playing a game, any of these things, if you can learn to be mindful, well, you'll start to let go of your addiction. I mean, you're, it's going to be fighting, opposites fighting. It's not likely that you can be very mindful when you're doing some of these things. Even when you're eating, it's quite difficult to be mindful at times. But it can be done. It's something that you can train yourself in. And if you work at it, you'll find that you really there's nothing special about any of these things. There's nothing great or satisfying. And you'll start to gain a deeper appreciation for equanimity, for peace, for objectivity. And you'll start to lose, these things will lose their hold on you. But there's certainly no good that comes from indulging. It's not like you gain by engaging that cycle because it's, it's, it's reinforcing partiality. It's just that to the extent that you're able to do the opposite, when you want something to say wanting, when you see something you want to say seeing, when you hear something you would like, say hearing, and so on, to that extent, well, you'll free yourself from that cycle and you'll move in the other direction. I mean, interest, it's interesting. It's important to not get, I think the, the biggest thing, it's important to not get too hard on yourself just because you like something. If you find something attractive and you, you you engage in sensual pleasure so on, as long as you're not a monk or on a meditation course. When you do that, there's no nothing really evil about it, and don't feel guilty or really awful about it, doing it. You can still cultivate good qualities, it's just a lot slower when you're engaging in those things. Oh, I don't know about this one. I think this was a mistake. Let me see. Mm, okay. 
No, that's an old one. That one I've already done. Okay, so last one. Last question. I'd like to know whether buddho as a mantra in meditation is a valid Buddhist technique. Yes, it's a valid Buddhist technique. It's outlined in the Visuddhimagga, but it's something the Buddha himself said. What we have to recognize is that it comes from something larger. It comes from something the Buddha said you should repeat to yourself when you're alone in the forest um, as a means of cultivating faith and confidence and uh, calming the mind. When the Buddha said, Itipiso bhagava rahang samma sambuddho vijja charana sampanno sugato loka vidu anuttaro purisa dhamma sarati sata deva manusana buddho bhagavati. So any one of those words, those are all words that refer back to the Buddha. They describe the Buddha. It's called recollection of the Buddha. And you can repeat all of them, or you can repeat just one part. Like some people say, Arahang Samma, Arahang Samma, Sambuddho, Sambuddho, Vijja Charana Sampanno, Vijja Charana Sampanno. There's chants that, that we do in Thailand and other countries. Sri Lanka does them as well where they'll repeat them one by one and then say, indeed the Buddha is such a being. It's absolutely a valid meditation technique. Does it contradict maha satipatthana? No, but it, it isn't satipatthana practice. It's samatha practice. It has the potential to calm your mind. It has the potential to create great states of calm and tranquility. But because the object... Um, I, actually, I might I have to qualify this. It has the potential. It's a it's a it's a tricky one. Let's put it that way. It's a tricky one because it's only a technicality that it's a tricky one. It's a tricky one because if your object is the Buddha, that being, and you're thinking of him, when you're thinking of him, that's samatha. But if you focus on the qualities, because all of these are qualities, then they become ultimate realities, and it is possible to gain insight. But the only way that would happen is if you were to take those qualities as a experience. And really that would only be possible... No, I'm going to say it's not vipassana. It can't be mindfulness, satipatthana practice, because it's not about your experience. It's about thinking about how that's a quality of the Buddha, which is still conceptual. You're still conceiving it in your mind. It's just they say that it can never lead to jhana, I think the Visuddhimagga says, because it... These qualities are not a thing, they're, they're qualities of mind. I don't know if that's too technical or not, but anyway, valid meditation technique isn't satipatthana practice, because it's not one of the four satipatthana. Is this also a direct path for the purification of beings, for the overcoming of sorrow limitation? No, it is not. Is this an effective way to observe the three marks of existence? No, it is not because it is a concept. If you think of the Buddha, or if you're thinking of the qualities of, that the Buddha has, that's all conceptual activity. So it can calm you, because these are good qualities. They're pure qualities. But it can't lead to real insight and understanding, and hence can't lead to purification of beings, overcoming of sorrow limitation. It's a good sort of introductory practice. Now, where it gets goes goes wrong, I think, is where people mix it with the breath. It's very common to say, buddho, buddho, in Thailand they do that. I think in Sri Lanka they're quite, they don't do that. I, I remember talking to people, monks about this in Sri Lanka. But in Thailand it's become a very common thing where you mix techniques. This is anapanasati, watching the breath. It's a valid technique as well. Buddho, buddho, this isn't buddh and this isn't do, so I don't know what the point is there, but the result is often a confusion where people think, where the, the meditator starts to think of this as Buddha. The Buddha is the breath or something like that. And they get all sorts of theories about that which are problematic, to say the least. Okay, so there, we've gone through about half the questions. The other half of the questions on our site are more challenging and probably going to take, many of them will probably have to have their own videos. But if there are more questions like this, I'll do this every so often where I go through them and answer the easier questions. So that's the Dhamma for tonight. Thank you all for listening.